Hello, you're watching another episode of Islamba today for ThinkTech Hawaii. I'm your host, Hamza Rafatan. Today's topic is what's next for Pakistan? Pakistan is going through an economic crunch. There's a lot of political instability. And uh, whether or not elections would take place is a huge question mark. And to answer these questions, we have with us veteran journalist Amir Ghori, and he's going to shed light on all the different contours which are defining Pakistan's landscape at this point in time and what can actually be expected as we move forward in 2023 and beyond. Mr. Amir Ghori, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you, Amza. All right, so Amir, let's start off with, you know, the basic question. What's next for Pakistan? Now, you do have rising sovereign debt. You do have an economic crisis. You do have a lot of political instability, and there are no signs of election. I think the situation is um, slightly nervous. Uh, I say slightly because uh, definitely we have uh, an interim government in place. They have a plan, and uh, there is an election commission, which is definitely trying to tell us that they are uh, working. Uh, we have a judiciary, which is uh, uh, you know also trying to tell the people that they are doing their work. Uh, as you mentioned in your intro, the issue is not politics. The issue is economy. And on that, Pakistan has, uh, you know, consistently failed over the years. And Pakistan has not only failed uh, to create uh, a viable economy where most of its uh, younger people are gainfully employed. We are now uh, a youth bulge, which is, I think, one of the most unmatched uh, youth bulges in the world which do not have uh, a job. And that is why we are seeing new trends that anybody who can leave Pakistan is ready to leave Pakistan, and there are many of them are leaving Pakistan. So, uh, you know, what next for Pakistan is? Uh, Pakistan, sadly, uh, is following a cyclical model of governance where every few years we see that the politicians who have been handpicked by Pakistan's very powerful establishment and then give a chance to run a country which uh, they do not have any experience of running. And that's why we have seen that uh, despite political parties uh, who claim that they are political parties, are no more than a political cult of few families. Uh, and that is why we have seen you know, a gradual decline in each and every facet of Pakistani governance and society, whether it's education, whether it's health, whether it's governance, whether it's uh, human rights or any other thing. So that's why it means I'm cons uh, people like me are concerned that when you know the interim government is trying to tell us that uh, they will actually hold elections uh, when uh, they are uh, you know basically uh, told by the election commission that the election commission is ready, uh, we are seeing a couple of hitches there as well. But I think Pakistan will uh, you know just jump over them. Whether they are happened, uh, they they happen in uh, next uh, three months or four months or five months, they will happen. And uh, political parties which have uh, you know recently worked uh, as a coalition government, although we know that that coalition was not a coalition of the uh, willing, you know, they know that uh, they had uh, been thrown a political challenge in the form of uh, Imran Khan and his political party. But since that challenge has been effectively taken care of. I say, again, effectively taken care of because I believe that they have been taken care of. Uh, and if Imran Khan and his political party have to fight back, uh, it will be an uphill task. So I think in five months, six months' time, whenever Pakistan holds an election, uh, these coalition uh, parties, uh, the coalition government, uh, you know, basically consisting of all major political parties, will have a task at their hand to uh, re-rail Pakistan where Pakistan can create an economy, Pakistan can start its projects, uh, which they said would bring a lot of prosperity, whether it's a lot of prosperity or any prosperity, with working with the Chinese and, you know, finding some peace in the region. Okay, so, but when you talk about the controversy in the presidency, I mean, this was one latest development that actually did take place, and it's made global headlines. For example, the president, uh, President Tariq Alvi, he claimed that, you know, his staff basically uh, put him in the dock by not agreeing to actually send those bills that he apparently did not sign back to the parliament. And then you had another situation where the staff uh, has written the letter back to the president by claiming that, uh, you know, fine, uh, his allegations are wrong. So you also have a lot of controversy with regard to acts such as the Army Act, as well as the, um, you know, the o OSA as well. So uh, there's a lot of chaos in the presidency as well. 
And it's very understandable. The reason is that uh, President Alvi uh, must be feeling very lonely in that presence. Uh, he belonged to Imran Khan's political party. And uh, most of the time, uh, it was alleged that he was behaving more like a party person rather than a president. Uh, and, you know, he did not show himself uh, or at least behaved, this is this is alleged widely uh, in the country, uh, that he has not behaved like a president of a federation. So when now, uh, technically because he was retiring on 9th of September, uh, I, he may prolong a little bit because there is no parliament at the moment, so next president cannot be elected. So these kind of letters which he is, uh, you know, sending back and forth, show the confusion in the presidency that a letter or the bills he had to sign there is a process and that is why the law ministry and his president's own office were saying that listen when we received these bills from the parliament we uh, duly you know within a day within 24 hours they were presented to the president to sign and the president basically sat on them now if the president uh, you know sat on them for days and then did not sign and ask the staff that to send them back uh, he was not uh, you know constitutionally required to do that he was constitutionally required to either sign and if he has some problem with any of the bills he should have written uh, his objections uh, for the parliament to reconsider those bills and if he if neither of the two processes were care, you know taken care of then those bills would automatically become law now when the president is saying you know my my concern is not what the president is doing or the president's staff is doing my concern is that Pakistan has come to a pass, Hamza, where the president and his office is putting these letters, which technically in a government are closed documents, are being you know posted on X, on social media, and within minutes, you know there is a, a national and maybe Pakistanis who are sitting outside Pakistan, you know, start taking uh, uh, pot shots. How this uh, you know country is being run? No, technically, we know that, uh, you know, when we saw the international trend, when President Trump started running uh, the State yeah. Department and the, uh, you know, uh, basically the different uh, departments of the American government through Twitter, you know, middle of the night, he would basically tweet and all the American uh, administration will start running uh, Helter Skelter uh, to see and or respond to the president's tweets because he was taking care of the foreign policy and the defense policy and any other policy, you know, with governance as well. Uh, the, taking uh, pot shots, uh, you know, with with the with the against the Democrats, etc. So Pakistanis, and we we saw the same yeah. trend. Yeah, yes, we, we saw the, the same trend in 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 England, right. in Europe, in India, and in Pakistan. Now this thing tells you that people who are sitting in the highest offices in this country are behaving like you know rowdy schoolboys uh, and trying to you know. And when you actually ask them, I say, "What have you done it?" Oh, we wanted to take the people of uh, Pakistan in confidence. Excuse me, you know, not all of Pakistan is on Twitter now. X, uh, sorry, uh, and not everybody reads English, you know. And more than that, not everybody, even educated one, do not understand how the legal documents are drafted and drafted. Uh, so, and as far as you know, taking people of Pakistan into confidence, they have voted you in. And uh, you will have a chance after five years, once you complete your term, you go back to people and send them whether they actually still conf have any confidence in you or not. If they have, they will retain you. Otherwise, they will change you. Uh, you know, this is the kind of stupidity which Pakistan is displaying at all levels. So let's talk about economic stupidity. And, you know, when we talk about economic stupidity, I was just watching, watching footage the other day where electricity bills were being burnt in Karachi. And there was a lot of protest with regard to how, you know, K-Electric officials were just going door to door to try and make sure that, you know, they could collect electricity bills. And there's a lot of public unrest. Even though that this unrest is not nationwide, there is the sentiment that this government is basically strangulating the common man. So what, in your view, is the way out as far as, you know, Pakistan's economic quagmire is concerned? Because obviously this, this basically relates to political stability and uh, whether or not governments could actually, you know, seek second or third terms in power. It really depends on whether the public would vote for them or not. Hamza, uh, in the 35 years since I, you know, joined media in Pakistan, I have heard from the civilian governments and the military governments, you know, same mantra. Because when military governments in place, they used to bring, you know, people, Pakistanis, who have served in different American banks or international banks 
for 30 years outside Pakistan. They did not have any connection with Pakistan or Pakistan's economy or Pakistan's governance. And they were brought in and basically posted here. Now, I've heard from them one single sentence that only 1% of Pakistanis pay tax. Now, this is a joke. If a state does not have the ability to take the taxes, you cannot you know, beg for taxes from the people who can pay taxes. And this is the situation still now. Recently, the outgoing uh, finance minister, Zak Dar, has used yeah. the same thing that, you know, people do not pay taxes and we are requesting them to pay taxes and all those people and we will find this way or that way and, uh, you know, invoke different uh, government bodies to know uh, about their, uh, you know, foreign tours and their bank accounts and the cars they have and houses and where they send their kids to school. Now, this, you know, thing uh, is better said than done. What Pakistan has been doing is, Pakistan is, you know, basically squeezing all those people who can pay taxes through their salaries. You know, so the only salaried class pay taxes. And secondly, most of the taxes are gathered through indirect uh, means. So, for example, you know, the, the way you mentioned, uh, raising the prices of all the utility utilities, you know, whether it's electricity or gas or petrol or water. Uh, and if not, you know, uh, all the FM, FMCGs. Uh, you actually buy a bread from, uh, you know, the bazaar. You will actually have to pay extra money. Now, I have paid, for example, I have paid that extra, whether it's 20% GST or 17% GST or 25% GST. Uh, you know, I have done my part. Whether the government is able to extract that tax from, you know, the seller or the market guy uh, is the state's ability. And state, for example, I have seen and I have discussed it with the ministers and the secretaries of the government of Pakistan. The state does not have the ability now. The system has been corrupted to the core where, you know, people in the shops and big shops and big malls will tell us that we will rather pay it to the inspector of the government rather than the taxes. You know, they are not being educated enough to say that, listen, if you basically have, a, you know, a, a perfectly uh, uh, you know qualified accountant or a lawyer, a tax lawyer, you might not be able to, you, you might not be actually asked to pay that much tax which you think that you will be paid. Uh, they right. do not know. They think that, you know, they will be paid on the total amount of their savings. Because so I know the, the, every year you are going to pay on your incoming and outgoing. And then, you know, there's a mathematics and all of that. And then you will pay the taxes. The state does not have the ability, Hamza. And if the state does not have the ability, and then on the other hand, there is not an economy which is working now. You know, Pakistan has seen that it's economic sectors and Pakistan does not sadly have too many, you know, economic uh, good stories to tell. But in the 90s, when the textile sector was working, you know, pretty okay uh, and Pakistan was producing, uh, you know, uh, knitted garments for the biggest brands in the world, whether it was Ralph or Adidas or Polo or whatever. And now all these businesses have gone out of this country. Now, Pakistani businessmen, I, I know many examples where they have moved their businesses outside Pakistan. That means that's a place like Bangladesh, all the factory yeah. workers will lose the job. You know, the, the, yeah. the rich man will not actually lose his business. He will have his clients in America or in Europe or anywhere, you know, where he has his clients. But the thing is, he will move his factory to Bangladesh or Egypt or Jordan uh, or in certain cases uh, in, in Southern America. I have, uh, you know, examples where Pakistanis have moved their money as far as, you know, Southern America. That means he will send only three or four managers there. And they will actually have to employ the local people, you know. So that means Pakistanis have lost jobs. In the last 30 years, Pakistan's textile sector has gone down. Pakistan does not have any other sector but to export rice and maybe a few other things. There was a hope that this new technologies, you know, Pakistan will start earning, not as India is earning, but maybe, you know, even 5% of what India is earning. But again, because there is no policy and the biggest... I think challenge for Pakistan is to remove its bureaucratic, you know, shenanigans from the the, the, the business, uh, you know, uh, and the commerce ministries, and put people in who know how to run a business. A bureaucrat, you know, who has been jumping from one department to the other department and uh, behaving like a glorified clerk, cannot yeah. run these ministries. He does not understand these ministries. He basically is charging money. As far as, you know, in other words, bribes to, you know, let whatever business is left. So I think that is a very dire situation. And again, 
the biggest thing was back in 2017, there was a hope when, you know, CPAC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, uh, you was uh, being touted in Islamabad, and I know, and you would have uh, definitely seen it uh, you, yourself, that there were a seminar every single day in Islamabad hotels and think tanks about CPAC. As uh, the, you know, the CPAC would be the game changer. And I spoke at one of the functions where Pakistan's, you know, think tanks were discussing it. And I said, listen, I have heard this word so many times, game changer. What is the game? You know, and the game was not in our hand. CPAC was not a project to prosper Pakistan. It was a Chinese project, but Pakistan would have benefited from it. But thing is, we know how in the last government and during the last government of Imran Khan, uh, him and some of his, you know, clo close uh, people who were working with him, I don't want to mention names here, oh, so you know, they choked that thing. They choked it. It basically came to grinding halt. And now it's very in a very minor way it has started rolling again. And that's why in Islamabad, you will see again hear about CPAC and China's involvement. But the thing is, Pakistan need to create a balance between Washington and Beijing and maybe a new power, you know, uh, uh, angle what we have seen here when Pakistan started uh, importing oil from Russia. Pakistan has been, you know, running from one powerful center to another asking or begging for a job or a task. You know, Pakistan, you know, the country of 240 million is not being run as an independent state, which is at peace with itself and is at peace with its region and where people who know their job are allowed to do their jobs. Let's come to the controversy between the president and the election commissioner of Pakistan, uh, Sikandar Sultan Raja and President Sarah Palvi. There was this conversation that did take place yesterday where they were just trading barbs over the fact that who is to decide when the election would actually take place. Now, the ECP commissioner basically said that uh, the election would take place based upon the ECP's own directives because of the fact that uh, the latest election act was actually amended. And the president claimed that, no, it has to be, uh, you know, it has to take place in 90 days. So when you see elections happening, you see it happening in February or March or maybe earlier because there's so much uncertainty with regards to this uh, painful democratic transition, which would ultimately usher in some degree of political stability, if not at all. Now, on that uh, very tricky question, I have, you know, two theories. One theory is what is being touted, but it was being, you know, told to the people, and then my conspiracy theory. Uh, first thing first, I think the president, whatever he's trying to do is, I think he's trying to tell his party, the PTI, uh, and, you know, this government, which is the caretaker government, that he means business. And if he is not listened to, then he will create, you know, whatever trouble he can create. But the thing is, let's, let's suppose that uh, the election commission of Pakistan has taken a very, you know, straightforward position that, listen, after the recent, uh, you know, uh, legislation through the parliament, uh, president has lost his, uh, you know, power to uh, push, you know, his idea that how Pakistan will and when Pakistan will actually have an election. He does not have the power to push the election commission to give a take. And uh, ECP say that, you know, we are the final arbiter here and we will do it when uh, we will do it. And then they have thrown this uh, spanner in the works that, listen, because after the digital, uh, you know, counting of the numbers yeah. of people who will be, you know, and the last, uh, before, between two, uh, 2018 and now 23, almost, you know, uh, 20 million people, new people have been added to Pakistan's population. That, that means a lot of people will be over 18 and they will be coming to the election booths for the first time in their life. They will use their right. So uh, election commission, I think, will, can work, you know, within the next three to four months on, on that. Because this whole thing, which has been, you know, being told to the people through television and through social media that maybe this new... Uh, limitation, uh, you know, the de de delimitation of constituencies and uh, as if it's a huge work. I don't think that because, you know, there is no parliament, you need a two-thirds ma majority of the constitution to change the numbers of constituencies in the country. You cannot do that. You know, so that means the number of constituencies will not change. Maybe certain tweaking on the basis of population, certain constituencies will be, you know, uh, recrafted or, re, uh, you know, arranged. Uh, but the number of seats will not change. So as an election commission can do this thing in next, uh, you know, three months if, uh, you know, they want to do it. Okay. The thing is, uh, the the outgoing government, some of, some of the ministers of the outgoing government and some of people who are, you know, 
know what is actually happening on this front, when they sit in television programs and discuss that, you know, this thing might take, you know, a few months, that means if election does not actually happen in November, they might actually happen in February. Uh, and some people say that, no, if Supreme Court actually wants, they can come in. I said, even Supreme Court cannot basically push the, the, the process of election. They can or pass an order. But in the final scheme of things, election commission will actually have to deliver it and they will deliver it and they will find, you know, legal ways and means to do it. Now, the conspiracy theory. You remember when yeah. Pakistan was finally given this 3.2 billion by the IMF, you know, they tied this thing to Pakistan in three tranches. And they said that 1 billion would be given to the outgoing government, which is gone. 1 billion would be given to this government, which is caretaker. And 1 billion would be given to the government, which will basically be in power, in seat after the election. So technically, if IMF sees and the international you know, donor agencies, whether they are all Bretton Wood, uh, you know, institutions, if they think that Pakistan is not listening to and Pakistan is not delivering on the promise of elections, and if there is not a government in time, in place, they might, you know, say that, okay, fine, this money is here for you already, you know, agreed upon, but they will be just going to give it to when there's a new election. And the way we are seeing in the last few weeks, the depletion of the Pakistani rupee against the dollar and against you know, the international currencies. I think the people who are in power, and we know who is in power, they will see that if Pakistan is financially be going into a pit, they might find ways and means to go for an earlier election, maybe in December, maybe you know towards the end of January. Now that is my theory at the moment, because the economy will be you know will be the key big question whether Pakistan will actually have an election on time or not. All right, so let's talk about the future of Pakistan's electoral landscape with, with without, without Khan and the PTI. Obviously, many of their workers were incarcerated. Uh, many of them have been allegedly tortured as well. And you do see this concerted attempt to try and break the party from the powers that be, as you rightly mentioned. So in that, in that regard, do you see any future for the PTI in the upcoming electoral landscape? Because obviously they're Barrister Ali Zafar just recently mentioned that, you know, they do need a level playing field in order for the elections to be committed smoothly. Uh, what, how do you see the future of the PTI and the future of Imran Khan? I think we will have to go, uh, you know, a few years uh, into Pakistan's recent past to understand what, you know, PTI is, what PTI was and how it became what it became. Now, in 2018, we know the PTI was not winning the election. We know that Imran Khan, you know, uh, at least I can say that I know certain, you know, facts and certain, uh, you know, uh, inside information, which we cannot discuss here, which, why? Because the people will deny it. But the thing is, uh, we, we had meetings over the last eight, nine years, and we saw how certain people who have uh, powerful positions in Pakistan's different, you know, southern districts or maybe in other areas who were hand-delivered to Imran Khan. You know, otherwise, Imran Khan, the way his personality is, the way he was running his political party, you have to see how he was, you know, growing politically from uh, 1997 onwards uh, till 19, uh, uh, 2008 and then 2013. Until 2013 or 2011, Imran Khan was a nobody in Pakistani politics, but a very popular, you know, public figure. And we right. know for that. Why? He was a cricketer and then hospital and then university and his philanthropic work. You know, um, I was raising money for him in Pakistan and outside as well. But the thing is, when it came to politics, I think people in power and that when we say that, that means the people from Rahul Pindi, you know, people who run from run this country from Rahul Pindi, uh, they decided that this two party system needs to be broken down. Pakistan People's Party and Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz need to be, you know, given a challenge. And that challenge was supposed to be coming from Punjab because uh, nobody, no political party can challenge uh, a political leader or politician of some weight as Nawashi had become. We know that he was also handpicked by the army and was, you know, uh, particularly crafted for a particular job, you know, against the People's Party. And that is why I think, and I have written about him, Imran Khan, as the political kraken uh, you know, you might have seen those space movies that, you know, when you do not actually yeah. uh, 
Yeah, release the Kraken. So the, the Kraken was released in Pakistani politics in the shape of Imran Khan to bring down Nawaz Sharif. The, the task was not, you know, to prop Imran. The, the task, I believe, and I'm saying it openly, was to bring down Nawaz Sharif. And he was brought down. Now, the cases we do not want to discuss. 2018, Imran Khan was delivered Pakistan. And certain people who have been jumping from one political party to the other political party in the last 20, 30 years of Pakistani politics were, you know, hand given to Imran Khan. Yeah. Now, those people have been taken away. You know, they have created their own political party. But Imran Khan, because he definitely is, uh, you know, uh, charisma, has been sold to millions of young Pakistanis who were sick and tired of the old political parties because they have also failed to connect with Pakistan youth. And that is the only thing which I think is, you know, basically being touted as Imran's popularity. But the thing is, Pakistan's election does not happen like an American election, where you have two parties. And it yeah. does not basically run on two personalities. Pakistan's it, politics it's not is not one of the call it either. Exactly. So the thing is, Imran will actually have to create a new team. Now, while he's in jail, I don't know whether he or his close associates, there are very few now left, you know, will be able to create a new team and that new team will be known to the people. You know, just supposing that, you know, he has achieved a level of popularity that whoever he will give a ticket to, you know, will downright, you know, outright win. I think this is a fallacy of Pakistani politics. I personally think uh, Imran will actually have to face a lot of difficulty, the legal difficulty in the courts. He will be, uh, you know, facing uh, Pakistani courts as he has made the other politicians face in the last five years. And while he will be, you know, running from this court to the other court, Pakistan will go into elections. What I see the future of Pakistan, the way you actually ask is, I think Pakistan will actually have a very weak, uh, you know, coalition government. I I see, I might be, you know, complete, uh, you know, proven completely wrong in a few months' time, but I see Punjab and Federation would be given uh, uh, to Pimal N. Now, when I say given, that means they will be allowed to win. That uh, they might not be, uh, you know, uh, deliberate or wide-scale uh, corruption in the, the electoral process. The reason is that in the last elections we saw, in the, uh, even in 2018, that Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz won a lot of provincial seats. And Pakistan, Punjab okay. has, you know, 141 seats, 142 seats for the National Assembly. I personally think they will actually win around 100 seats. Uh, reason is, and then because the southern Punjab, we have seen, again, you know, the, the uh, emergence of a new political party, basically based on all those people who were uh, touted as selectables or electables in the last elections. Now, those selectables, electables, the main people who are again touted as Imran Khan's, uh, you know, ATMs, uh, machines, uh, are not with him. And they're angry because they did not get what they thought would get under Imran's government. And uh, they would definitely go with the government who would be, uh, you know, winning most seats. And uh, Pakistan People's Party uh, has sinned, you know, completely in their grip. We will see... Uh, Malana Fazlul Rahman's party again winning few seats in uh, KP, and he also wins few seats in Balochistan. The yeah. other party which was created uh, in Balochistan, the uh, Balochistan Awami Party, oh, I think one. that main characters, the main characters of that party, uh, would uh, join either PMLN or Pakistan People's Party. The, uh, you know, and uh, whoever is left uh, will actually have to agree to the dynamics. What I see Pakistan is having, you know, a coalition government based on five to six or may, maybe seven, eight uh, parties. It will be a weak government given a task to, you know, uh, resurrect Pakistan's economy. Uh, again, the biggest challenge any government would uh, face in Pakistan. As far as Imran Khan is concerned, I think uh, his uh, difficult days uh, are uh, ahead. He is not as kind of uh, uh, over the difficult days. His difficult days uh, are, are uh, you know, ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm just we're running short on time. So very briefly, uh, obviously Pakistan is also located in a neighborhood where you do see the spike in terrorism pretty much. I mean, there's a palpable threat from terrorism. We've had TTP attacks within Pakistan. The Afghan government in Kabul is not necessarily 
are willing to try and crack down on all these nefarious elements. I mean, you have the likes of uh, the Islamic, um, you know, the uh, the ETIM or the East Pakistan Islamic Movement, as well as the TTP in Helmand Province as well. So how do you think Pakistan will be able to navigate through these security challenges? If you could just briefly just tell me uh, what the security landscape would look like uh, as we move forward. I think the security landscape would, uh, you know, get worse uh, if Pakistan does not, uh, you know, take steps. And these steps uh, do not mean that, you know, try to kill all those people because it beats me uh, badly, whether it's uh, the TTP, the Tariq Taliban, Pakistan, groups like them, or ISIS, or this movement or that movement, because most of uh, these groups, uh, you know, you have studied uh, in America and you understand international relations and how international politics is run. You know, it beats me completely how these groups who are working in landlocked areas, you know, whether they were, uh, you know, ISIS when he is fighting in Syria uh, or, uh, you know, Tariq Taliban, Pakistan, which is now fighting technically, you know, against both enemies, you know, Taliban were not uh, pro TTP, and Pakistan definitely wants to see the end of them. How they are able to maintain, you know, this warfare for years. So we need to understand that. And unless and until Pakistan finds peace with the countries in the region, and I'm right. saying India and Afghanistan, because I was there covering, uh, you know, when the American officials in the highest level came to see the Taliban in Qatar in 2013. Now, the thing is, imagine your enemies, you're fighting your enemies, you're coming to talk to Taliban, who are technically your enemies in Afghanistan, but they're based in Qatar, which is the head office of the Central Command, and the American Secretary of State, John Kerry, is flying in to meet, have a discussion. That means the game is already up. That means Taliban, you know, were working with the Americans, you know, uh, and uh, what we have seen you know, Afghanistan actually has seen back-to-back -back eight years of uh, Karzai and then uh, Ashraf Ghani. And then the way Afghanistan has been handed over to Taliban, I think Taliban are sitting in Kabul. They are not concerned about Pakistan and Pakistan security. They are, yeah. you know, maybe dealing with some other bigger issues. Maybe the China, maybe, the, you know, the, the BRI, maybe the Chinese uh, effort to get via Afghanistan to Iran and other countries. So they might be given a bigger task by other. This is, again, my theory. Pakistan will have to find peace with India. And how Pakistan will be able to find that peace, it's up to Pakistanis. Pakistan will actually have, again, the way I say in earlier in your program, have to find a workable you know, relationship with Washington and Beijing. Washington is seeing Pakistan now as an angry old you know, ally who is ready to ditch Washington in, uh, you know, hope of better relations and better economy with the China. And this, the uh, the beginning of the new Cold War between Be uh, Beijing and Washington, you know, Pakistan, you know, cannot be on the wrong side. So Pakistan need to learn from the countries of the region, like for, uh, Iran, for example, is under 40 years of international sanctions, but it's still, still surviving. You know, it is talking to the Europeans and also the Americans. And it is selling oil and gas to the Indians and the Chinese. So why Pakistan actually has to be a country which talks about its relationship with the West uh, and the East is finding it hard to find peace within. Because remember, Pakistan was not fighting a war with India or China or Afghanistan or Iran. So when Pakistan army says that, you know, we are the most battle-hardened army in the region, losing these many soldiers, the big question to be asked is, who are, they, who, who are you fighting with? If you cannot able, if you're not able to actually contain a war within your borders for the last 30 years, you need to seriously rework the model and then, you know, trying to find a peace. Veteran journalist Amir Bari, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you, Hamza. Thank you for having me. That's all that we have from Islamabad today on Think Tech Hawaii. You can follow us on our social media pages and do provide us with your valuable feedback. Until next time, take care.